You know, I wasn't in the mood for a story now, but、uh, I think I'm in the mood for a story. Do you guys want to hear a story? Yokoso o w a s h i t a r e Got a story today. So, once upon a time, during the reign of Emperor Shomu, there was in the district, the district, the district, the region, the area, I don't know how to translate this word, but in the district, let's go with district, of Nakashima in the province of Owari, there was a man by the name of Owari no Kusakari. Is what one of the sources that I have, the, the, one of the translations of the sources that I'm looking at says, it says it's Kusakari, but when I look at the kanji in the like another source, I read it as Kukuri. So I don't know. Sorry. It's ancient Japanese. It's, it's old. <laughs> it's been a long time. Things don't. Here's the deal I'm not going to get into an extended discussion about the Japanese language and how it's evolved, and especially its writing system, because it, it, it's not pretty. Okay? It's. Complicated and weird, and just okay. I don't know what his name is. Honestly, it doesn't even matter, so I don't even know why I'm going on like this. But anyway, this guy was the <sighs> more language problem the director, the manager, the head honcho. I don't know how to translate this other than he was the guy in charge of this region, district, area, whatever of Nakashima. Okay, just he's a kind of important person, but not really. Okay, he's like a mayor, something like that. But He had a wife, and that's who this story is actually about. You may remember her from the previous story, and she's great. As you will come to see, she's a fantastic character. She's lovely. She's awesome. And this story just further proves that. Anyway, this woman, who we will call the woman of Owari, you know, she was like her husband. She was from Owari, this province. But she was from a different district called Aichi, which any of you who know. Modern Japanese geography may know where Aichiken currently is. So she was from around that neck of the woods. Okay. Her home village was known as Katawa, and she was actually the granddaughter of a monk by the name of Dojo, who, being the granddaughter of a, I guess, a famous monk, she had special powers, special magical Buddha powers. Now, judging by appearances, you wouldn't guess that she was anything special. She was a fairly small woman, a very Dainty damsel, as slender and as pliant as a silk string, is how the story describes her, which is kind of a very poetic way of saying she's small. But speaking of strings, she was also really good at weaving. She was very womanly in her behavior, too. And one day she wove for her husband a really exquisitely nice robe. It was top of the line, would have sold for a ton of money, and she spun it for her husband just out of pure love. She just wanted to do something nice for him. And of course, the husband now rocking this new drip. Is that what you guys call it? Drip? Is that, is that am, I, am I cool yet? Am I cool? Riz? Is that what we'll go with? Yeah. Now he's all rizzed up, right? Because he's got this fancy, these fancy new clothes. And he walks into work, you know, his chest is out. He's happy, he's beaming because he just has the greatest wife, and she made this amazing, this ama these amazing robes for him. They're just great. And it's awesome. He's having a good time. He's loving it until he's not. Because that piece of clothing was catching everybody's eye. And not just his co workers, but the governor of the province as well saw how nice this robe was and decided he wanted to take it for himself. And so he confiscated it from this man, just yoinked it. Right off of his back. And he said something along the lines of, You don't deserve something like this, you poor ignorant sod. Get out of here. Because、mm. I guess some people could have gotten away with that back in the day. And you know, this governor was probably likely from the capital. You know, they had a thing back there where in the capital was where people who actually mattered live, you know, or at least that's how they thought about it. And anybody who went out into the provinces was basically mingling with the barely human, subhuman types of people who didn't understand the finer things of life. And so, for a lot of governors, when they were appointed to go govern out in the provinces, they tried very much to get out of it and they would send representatives to the provinces to overlook everything for them. But this guy, however, was not one of those people. He did not send somebody to overlook Owari for him. He instead went out himself. But maybe because he felt like he was getting looked down on by the people in the capital or he was just that much of a douchebag, he decided that he could just take whatever he wanted.、Hmm. The rest of these peasants, who cares? So after work, this man comes home and he's just clearly distraught. He's not wearing his robes anymore. Like they've been yoinked. And he's just silent in classic masculine fashion. He doesn't open up immediately. He just kind of wanders home all upset, clearly distraught. And of course, his wife asks him, Hey, why aren't you wearing your robes? What happened? And he explained the situation to her. He just said, Well, it was a nice robe and、uh, the governor took it. 
just took it right off my back. Nothing I could do about it. She looks at him and goes, do you really miss it that badly? And he goes, of course I do. It was an amazing robe. It was fantastic. I absolutely hate that it's gone now. And that's when the woman of Owari decided she needed to take things into her own hands. And if you remember from the previous story, the woman of Owari does not like injustice. She doesn't like it when the vixen of Mino is bullying people in the next province over. But how much more is she going to be upset if somebody causes an injustice to her husband? Oh yeah. Some people are going to get it. They're going to get it. So she immediately just heads off for where the governor is. Just boom. Beelines it straight there. I can imagine she's got this like death glare in her eyes. She means business. There's a fire lit under her. But she marches right up to the governor and demands, give me my husband's robes back now. And the governor, of course, being the snooty frou-frou elitist that he is, just kind of looks her up and down, doesn't see anything impressive. She's small. What's she going to do? And he just goes, who do you think you are? Guards, get her out of my sight. And of course, two guards come and they each grab her and they try to pull her and drag her out. But as soon as they pull, she doesn't budge. Not a muscle is moved. She just stands there. And before anybody has a moment to realize, whoa, what's going on and process what's happening, she then, with two fingers, hooks them into the governor's shirt and with using just two fingers, drags him out of the building, across the courtyard, just outside the gate, and throws him down on the ground and looks at him and says, I want my husband's robe back now. And the governor, now terrified, obviously, with no further objections, just throws himself to his knees. He says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I didn't mean anything. I didn't mean anything. Here, here's the robe. Please take it back home. And she, being the magnanimous woman that she is, just keeps giving him a death glare, takes the robe back, and with no more words, just goes on home. She washes the robe, cleans it up, she gives it back to her husband. Oh, the story also, for some reason, at this point mentions that she could snap bamboo, really strong bamboo, like they were bits of string. Don't know why it just randomly throws that in there. We already know she's super strong, but okay, it's there. But anyway, great. Robe secured. Mission accomplished. Everything is good now. Story is over. Except it's not, because it wasn't all good. As with everything, word gets around of what just happened. Right? And this is the governor we're talking about. There's not very many more rungs up the social ladder until you get to the emperor. The governors were actual nobility. And this woman, this dainty little woman, just came in and with two fingers manhandled this governor and made him squeal like the little rat that he is and gave the robe that he stole back. That's going to cause some problems. But whether or not the governor was actually that much of an idiot to try to mess with this woman or her family, that wasn't actually where the problem was. Because you see, this woman's husband's parents, this woman's parents-in-law, came to this woman's husband and started telling him, you need to get rid of your wife. What she did to the governor is going to bring bad repercussions on all of us. The governor is not going to forget this and he's going to come back with a vengeance. The only way we can save ourselves from this, you can save yourself and you can save us, is if you get rid of her. She needs to go. Which like, okay, are you kidding me? She does a good thing. She administers justice properly and you're trying to get her husband to divorce her? What? I'm sure we've all heard stories about horrible, horrible parents-in-law. These guys are like the worst. They suck. But they're not as bad as the husband because he goes, you know what, parents, I know my wife is super strong and I know she made me great robes and I know she went out of her way to get them back for me, but you have a point. And I know she just literally made the governor squeal like a pig, but you know, you have a point. I should get rid of her. And so that's what he does. He divorces her. Just tosses her out. Okay, bye. Have fun. Adios. I'm too scared. Even though you're my wife, I'm too scared of what the governor's gonna do, even though I already know you can kick his tushy. Like, seriously. Whoa, was your masculinity... <laughs> was your masculinity that fragile that you were worried that your super powerful wife was just stronger than you? I mean, come on. But like, what a douchebag. A tool. I'm not gonna quote Owen Rogers here, but he is. He's a tool. He's a tool. He's a freaking tool. Tool of his freaking parents who are just assholes pardon my french but anyway that sucks this woman goes back to her original home which was probably her parents so hmm, welcome to the life of a millennial and 
life goes on, you know, things just go back to normal. She goes back to living as just a normal woman and doing whatever she normally does. And then one day, because her story's not over, she's out by the river doing her womanly duties and she's washing clothes in the river. You know, and again, this is what I love about her. She's this hyper powerful, hyper, hyper strong woman. She could do anything she wanted. She could manhandle, she could be a vixen of Mino. She could bully all the men into giving her everything she ever wanted, but she didn't. She was a good woman. She just wanted to be happy. She wanted to be a housewife. She wanted to be the one who washed clothes. I'm sure she would have loved a family. I'm sure she would have loved to continue making clothes for a loving husband. But you know, apparently, at the cost of having super strength, you don't get to be happy. What cruel, cruel fate. Anyway, so one day this woman is by the river, washing clothes, just minding her own business, when a merchant comes sailing up on a small boat. And I don't know if this merchant was drunk, or what was wrong with him. Maybe he had a, maybe he had a small, I don't know. But he starts making fun of her. He just sees this small woman doing womanly things, just doing her duties, just going about living life, and he decides it'd be a good idea to make fun of her. So he starts making fun of her, for no reason. And again, this woman just rolls her eyes, and she tries to ignore it. She tries to be the bigger person, even though she's smaller than most of everybody. But he keeps badgering her, just annoying. And she just ignores him again. And this continues multiple times until he finally gets a reaction. And without looking at him, she just says, if you don't shut your mouth, I'm gonna deck you in the face. And he had to take a second, because this woman just spoke back to him. This little dainty woman. And again, I don't know if he was drunk. I don't know if he was just a douche, but he decided that he wasn't gonna stand for that. That was a bridge too far. <laughs> Heaven forbid somebody that you're making fun of should snap back at you. So he sails his boat right up next to her and he takes her idea for himself and he decks her in the face. And she just takes it and she doesn't say anything. She doesn't collapse. She doesn't scream because she's, you know, a superhero. And instead, she just looks him dead in the eye and she just punches a hole right through his boat, right through the front of his boat. So his boat starts taking on water and starts sinking with him and all the valuables in it. And so he freaks out. And he sees a group of hirelings just kind of hanging out. And he really quickly turns to them and says, Hey, I will pay you to get all this stuff off of my boat before it sinks. Hurry. And again, this is going to show just how much she is about, like, righteousness. I don't know for a better word. But she just looks at him and says in a loud voice, I smashed your boat because you're a douchebag. And you're trying to drag other people into this? Really, dude? And with that, she grabbed the dude's boat dragged it with him and all his valuables in it up onto the shore, took it maybe a hundred yards or so inland, and then just dropped it right there. You know, like, okay, because people can just do that. And this man, of course, now realizing that this woman is like freakishly strong, like supernaturally strong and could probably just snap him in two with her bare hands. He throws himself to his knees and he starts apologizing profusely. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to. I was in the wrong. You were in the right. Please forgive me. I didn't mean to. I'll, I'll stop. I'll never do it again. And of course, she being a genuinely good woman, and maybe she realized that he was just drunk or he did have a small, you know, she let him go. Nary an extra word. Not a single word. But apparently she left some kind of an impression on him because he did come back later with 500 men. Now, from the story, it really doesn't sound like he was trying to get revenge. It sounds like he was just so amazed that he legitimately wanted to try and test and see how powerful she was, how strong she was. And so they agreed to get these 500 men to, I guess, using a rope to try to pull her, to move her from her place. But even 500 men couldn't do it. And from this, everyone determined that the woman of Owari was stronger than 500 men. Super heroine, proportionally strong, right? And anyone who ever saw this woman and how strong she was, was absolutely astounded by it. And thus, is it said that this woman must have had some kind of a karmic happening in a previous life that caused her to be born as a woman so incredibly strong? And that's it. That's the end of the story. And quite frankly, I really like this story. I really like the woman of Owari. I think Disney should make a animated adaptation of her story. It would be great. Or maybe the people who do Marvel movies could make a superhero inspired by her because she's great. If they were to do that, maybe their movies wouldn't suck so bad as they have been. <laughs> Is that a little too confrontational? That might be a little too confrontational, but like, come on, come on. This woman, Captain Marvel's got nothing on her. Like, come on, bro. Anyways, I'm done rambling. Well, that's the end of the story. Uh, again, thank you for stopping by and listening yet again. Ito, Ito, hold on. <laughs>
How can I not do this? Ito katejike no koso haberi kere. Please like, share, and subscribe. Let me know what you think. Uh, and most importantly, share. Share to all your weeb friends. I love these little folk tales. I actually had the pleasure of participating in a local festival and seeing local folk dancing and enjoying local cuisine. And, you know, you can really tell when you go to some of these events that a lot of these traditions really do run really, really deep. Like these go back a long, long time. And it's great that I get this opportunity to take some of these stories that have been in Japan for over a thousand years and bring them to you guys. I, I actually really do enjoy it, even though my acting could use a little bit more of a touch up and I'm still learning a lot of things. <laughs> Please bear with me. But anyways, thank you and we'll see you in the next one.